Hello friends, this is Dean from uh, Blinko Glass in Norton, West Virginia again. We're really trying to, to do all the COVID things right, but I'm in the office and there's just a few of us here, so I'm going to brazenly take this off so that you might be able to understand what I'm saying. Um, a hillbilly accent filtered through a mask makes it really hard for most people to know what I'm up to. So let's talk about, uh, the topic for today is going to be, we're going to talk about our design influences at Blinko. And, and the, I think the kind of the root question that we've asked over time is, why is your glass thick? Why is your glass heavy? You know, why is it not thin? And there's a perception that thin glass is somehow more elegant and better. So I'd like to take just a deep dive into that. Uh, I would add that most of this is conjectural, although uh, a result of decades of of writing about, researching, handling, visiting uh, glass companies in America and abroad. So if you have other thoughts or questions, do feel free to, to express those below. Don't forget to like and share this. Um, hopefully you will like it. So here we're going to dive into it. As you probably know, the origins of the glass industry as such are Italian. Uh, Johnny kind of thought to be uh, an island off of Venice, uh, an island so that historically the argument was that the hot glass furnaces were separated from burning down the town and so that the glass workers who were uh, highly skilled and had a, a skill set that was very coveted could kind of be crowded and not let leave the, the uh, Italian city-state. So Italian glass really sets the precedent for a lot of glass around the world. This is in the Italian manner. This is a piece from around the early 20th century, uh, part of a large set. There have been wine glasses. This is a champagne or uh, sherbet. Um, if there was anything else one could do to this little fellow, it would be really hard to figure out what that might be. It's made of several colors of glass, has a pink foot and a pink bowl. The foot and the bowl have inclusions of a metallic foil of some kind. Um, so it has this flex of gold, quote unquote, throughout it. The stem in the middle is hand worked, not lamp worked as we would expect it to be today. And this is a, this little fellow is a fish, which makes tons of sense if you're uh, on an island off the coast of Italy, doesn't it? There are also dragon stems, which are exceedingly famous as kind of Italian Renaissance stems. But the work here is fragile, thin, elegant, colorful, playful. You probably come up with another dozen or two explanations. Uh, Ponto on the bottom is exceedingly small. The whole thing's been worked closely, reheated, reheated, reheated. This would have been purchased as a part of a set when you did the Grand Tour, 1890, 19. 10, um, chipped back to your American big house and uh, enjoyed for years and generations until somebody put the, the market from which I acquired this fellow. This kind of gets the essence of Italian glass. The idea that working it with optics in it and, and all these layers and curves and bubbles and a great deal of technique, a great deal of finesse and a very specific aesthetic about being thin, colorful, light. And I, I can't help but think of most Italian glasses playful. So this is the standard we set. And this is, I would suggest you, where the idea of glass, good glasses, thin comes from, is this Italian um, mindset, this Italian aesthetic. So a little dolphin stem, cousin to the dragon stems, uh, what, 120 years old, give or take in the Italian tradition, uh, that referencing a, a Renaissance uh, predecessor in style. So what, what happens is that, and I, I can't explain to you all the origins of why the designs chose this, but the, the Scandinavian glass workers, uh, Danes, Swedes, all, all of those guys create an entirely different form of glass, thick, heavy, single color or maybe a few colors imposed on each other, 
but not in a delicate way, in a bold way, in a very dramatic way. And, and this becomes part of the whole reaction to the English and or Italian aesthetic at the time. World War II puts this into play, I suggest. Uh, it was there before, but World War II really gives us a preference for the guys in the north and their neutrality and um, Italian things for a while, particularly you know, post Mussolini, are not held in such high regard. No challenge to the skill set or what's being made there, but that is we just don't want to buy Italian for a while. So there's this searching for another aesthetic. You may remember terms like Danish modern, uh, Swedish. So all these Scandinavian influences that come into lots of different designs, furniture as well as glass. So let's talk about what some of it looks like for a few moments. Um, I spent some time at home digging through our glass, trying to find examples of it. And if any of you are glassaholics out there, you know what that means. It's in a box somewhere. Couldn't find much. Uh, this would definitely be in that style, but this is probably an American piece and possibly a, a Morgantown, West Virginia piece, but made very much like uh, what we would see in Orifers. I think that probably is where I'm first aware of this single color cased in thick, heavy crystal. Uh, very organic shape. Uh, if there's a contrast to this elegant, heavily worked, multiple colored piece, it's this. Organic, fluid, single colors, simple, and the use of crystal. That's kind of the, the vocabulary difference, and I mean, they're extreme, aren't they? So what we did here, Blinko is making only cylinders for sheet glass, hand-blown, mouth-blown cylinders, up until the beginning of the Depression. This part of the story is widely known and, and often written about. Along comes the Great Depression in America. All of a sudden, churches are being scaled way back or not built at all during the Depression. Same with um, homes or other architectural uses of leaded glass. They just pretty much ceased to be a popular thing at this time. So. Uh, the younger Blinko, Bill Sr., suggests that maybe they should make tableware, uh, giftware. Right. The story says that Father, the original Mr. Blinko, was not so convinced, but his son uh, persisted, and they hired two Swedish glass workers from a factory in Huntington, which is 20 minutes away. Um, they had been glass blowers at Huntington Tumbler. Uh, depression era, quote unquote, elegant depression glass factory of considerable size, but it folds in, in the early 30s. So you get glass workers here who are looking for employment. Blanco considering making some uh, table and giftware. Perfect story here. You got a skill set and a need. So they come to Blanco. The two brothers are named Axel Mueller, and I always have to remember this up. Um, Louis, who I'm sure isn't Louis, it's Louis uh, Miller. One of them has kept his Swedish name and the other has anglicized uh, for the American consumption. You know, you, Miller is very uh, American sounding, or at least British sounding, versus Mueller. So Axel and Louis are brothers, but they've different last names because one of them has anglicized. This uh, frame portrait uh, exist in the collection here at the Blinko factory. And it is one of two that are shown in the back of Eason Eig's book on early Blinko years. Um, and this is either Alex or uh, Luis. I don't know which one. The other brother is, is shown in the book, but not in our collection. So uh, a, a Scandinavian, Swedish actually, glass worker who was in our area making glass and was hired to come here and help Blinko get into the tableware and uh, giftware lines. So if those are our first glass blowers, what they're going to bring is the tradition which they know. Uh, so we're going to start off with Swedish Scandinavian influences. So they come uh, probably in the 30s for sure, sometime between 1930 and maybe even 29, uh, we start making 
some tableware in 29. I, I don't know which comes first, the tableware and the need for glass workers or the glass workers and then the introduction of tableware. There's a lot of this that we don't know very much about. Uh, if any of you do know or have documentation, uh, we'd love to hear that and share that with us, please. The next wave of uh, Swedish influence here is Carl uh, Ericsson. Ericsson becomes a pretty well-known glass worker in America and spreads a number of design elements in his wake. He's first at uh, Pearpoint in uh, New England, and a lot of their glass becomes uh, thick, heavy, often a, with a crystal ball and stem with inclusions of controlled bubbles. Very much a Scandinavian Swedish glass style and technique, heavy, thick, um, using clear trapped air bubbles instead of you know, other colors, other decorations. So very much in the quote unquote modern tradition. Carl comes here in 37 and stays to 42 when he goes with his brother to open a glass factory in Ohio. <clears throat> Ericsson Glass, which lasts for a couple of decades, and makes a great deal of very well-known uh, Swedish-style American mid-century modern. Excuse me. <coughs> so, our first influences are the two Swedes we hire, the brothers with different last names, and then uh, a few years later we'd have uh, Carl Ericsson coming through, impacting even further our design influences. <coughs> so our, our aesthetic is going to be our skill set, which we're teaching our class players, all going to be in the Swedish tradition. And it just keeps popping up. Things like this uh, candle block, which we made years later, is still in that same tradition. If you, if you look at much Scandinavian glass, Swedish glass, <coughs> excuse me, you might think of Costa Boda, uh, Orfers, again, the people who would have made things most, in my mind, most similar to this single piece of color in thick crystal. So look at Costa Boda, Orfers, and other Scandinavian glass houses for design influences. The other thing they bring to our glass palette is the use of colors that pink, gold, aqua. Smoke brownish industrial gray. Um, it comes from that same uh, interest in modernism, where instead of being bright and bold colors, we look at industrial looking colors, the things that had to do with an entirely different aesthetic. <coughs> Excuse me. Could someone please get me a bottle of water? <coughs> um, this is another American glass company following some of those same traditions, <coughs> not Blanco but you've just cased it over, it's not with simple, highly tooled, little elegant details, but just a large blob of color wrapping around the bottom of this piece, this whole bud vase, but the body's crystal. I mean, these two are cousins, different companies, mm, a couple decades different in time. That's the look of that thick use of colors glass. When it comes to actually what's made here at Blinko, I have a couple samples. <clears throat> what we might have from that time period would mostly be locked in our museum and cases. <coughs> and sad to say that getting things out of our museum cases is very difficult because it's a special little strange key. Anyway, so we dug around here looking for things that, that were in that tradition that were not locked up. This little simple ashtray is very much in the Ericsson style. Don't know that he was the one that introduced that, it to us, but thick, heavy, pontled. It looks so much like a piece of Blinko we would make today. The color is, is again, not a bright, vibrant color, but a dark honey amber. This is the, the, the larger size ashtray in that same style. I do not think this is a particularly old one. That I believe to be f from the kind of vintage. Uh, this may be a, a couple of decades later, but still making the same exact idea uh, of an ashtray with rest here for cigarettes or uh, cigars, maybe pipes even big, thick stuff. I have two pages from a catalog, an original catalog that we have here uh, to share with you, to show you some of these shapes. But most importantly, catalogs are undated. The cover to this one looks like this. And it dates from sometime around the very end of the 1940s or the 
first half of the 1950s. Thank you very much. Excuse me, please. Does that constitute a sponsorship or something? What was it meant to be? This is a page out of the catalog. Again, 49, 52, and 52, somewhere thereabout. And it says on it, heavy Swedish type glass. Now, if you have any doubts about our influences on design or what we're making this and marketing this as, there it is. Uh, we're, we're telling the world, now, remember again, the late 40s, early 50s, after World War II. So we're, we're wanting to distance ourselves from the Axis power um, and, and their production and looking very much to others. This is the second page from the same catalog showing, and this has a bunch of the air trap stems and the ashtrays in the form that we just saw. Note, solid body, uh, collar, uh, uh, if it has a second collar, it's attached in big bold. The first page you saw those flames running down the side. I might add that after Blinko made those, <clears throat> they were popularized by Bischoff, a company right down the road from us in the other direction for a number of years. So copied air trap stems, again, an Ericsson influence. <clears throat> so our argument to you is this. Why is Blinko thick, heavy glass? It is thick and heavy because that is the origins, and that's our heritage as far as making glass. Some people would follow a tradition of English crystal, <coughs> quote-unquote rock crystal, influenced to a large extent by uh, Italian glass makers, and, and made to compete with Italian and other glass on the continent. But we learned, we chose to follow aesthetically a very Scandinavian slash Swedish approach to glass technique and production and aesthetic. So we end up making things that look like this, thick, heavy, um, very modern, very, very uh, quote unquote contemporary in the look um, and, and not the more detailed English Victorian or the Italian. Um, do they have the ability to ask questions? Can you, can you see them there? Okay, so I, I get a, a nod from my cohort Bryson behind the camera that if you have questions at this point, you can ask them and he can share those with me. I do not know that we'll be able to answer them, but I would love to hear them and to take just a few moments here before we sign off to, to field questions about why are glasses thick and, and what and how that's been influenced by a Scandinavian, specifically Swedish glass design and glass workers. <coughs> okay, think up your questions. I will try to <coughs> get the tickle out of my throat. I would like to think there are no questions because it covers the topic so thoroughly that you're completely uh, informed, but I, I know that's not true because I did, I don't know enough about some of the little caveats in this. You know, um, what actually were the Ericsson pieces that he designed when he, here, when he was here with us? If you know some of that or have reason to believe and be able to document some of that, we'd love to know. Uh, surely he wasn't the only uh, person who came in our second wave of uh, Swedish glass workers. So if you have things to share now or later, we'd love to hear them. And the word share always reminds me that I'm supposed to encourage you to like and to share this video. No questions? None. For those of you who watch this later, we're live as I'm speaking to you, uh, no live questions, but for those of you who watch it later, if you have them, post them to our social media. Um, what would be the best place? Uh, and comments on this, thank you. And we will try to get back to you with answers as best we can. Does, uh, that's a great. Uh, that's a great question. Does thicker blin blinko glass enhance the color and re reflection of th over thinner glass? Okay, um, there's a big part of this story here because historically, what we made was sheet glass for use in architectural uh, applications, sp specifically windows. So when you blow our glass out to the th thinness of a look, look at this little fellow. It's a perfect example. Uh, this is a piece of Morgantown glass from Morgantown, West Virginia. As the color gets thin up here, 
this smoke color becomes almost crystal. In the bottom where it's a sham or a thick, ever wonder where the word sham came from? It's that thick solid that kind of gives the illusion that there's a vessel to hold, but it, it, it's not, it's misrepresenting its volume. It's much darker, exactly the same with our glass. We were making this for windows, but if we make it into a, a thicker piece, the color concentration is much greater. So you take a quarter inch or less thick, eighth inch maybe, piece of window glass compared to you know, the thick edge of, oh my goodness, think about this fellow, a, big, a very solid piece of glass. Yes, concentration of the thickness of the glass is going to make the color much denser, much brighter, much bolder. Are vintage and older pieces of glass stamped, and how would you know a piece is Blinko? Um, I've been feuding a similar question to that for decades. It, it is not stamped. Um, historically, glass came with a paper label uh, it were for, for lots of reasons about marketing and perception. It, it would not have been marked on any American glass hardly up until the collectible era. A few people did. Uh, mostly very high-end glass companies. Blinko is not marked for decades. You learn it by two things, color and form. Color and form. How you learn those, you study and you study and you study some more. Um, there's no quick and easy answer. Uh, the reward is when you find a piece that you think is Blinko and take it home and match it up and it is, and then that little adrenaline rush like you know, finding a treasure. So all of our catalogs are scanned and on our website. A few of them are not um, scanned well, though. They're, they're a little out of focus. And we will correct that and, and update those. But all of the catalogs that we have are on our website for you to browse. Uh, Blinko Colors, we've spoken about this before. We have an amazing number of colors in our uh, repertoire of possible colors, usually six, five, seven, eight at a time in the line. So the colors change over time a great deal. Uh, the Blinko website talks a little bit about color, but probably the best arrangement of color is on um, the, the Blinko website, which is Hillary's site. One of you at home, I'm supposed to type that in right now so that he sees it. <clears throat> anyway, th there is a second Blinko uh, several Blinko sites. One of the others brings it into color and has the name of the color and groupings. Uh, maybe that is the Blinko Collector's site as a Facebook page. I'm sorry to be vague on that, but they have grouped them by color and given them names. So study the color, study the shape. Study the color, study the shape. Another question. Um, any advice on how to remove wax from candle holders? Yeah. The question is about removing wax from candle holders. Uh, if it doesn't have wax in it, then it, somebody didn't really enjoy it or appreciate it, did they? Um, there are lots of answers. Uh, some people insist you should put it in the freezer and the ice will, uh, the, the cold will make the ice peel and crack off. I've always just been a fan of, of tepid water and then kind of picking it out. It, it comes off fairly easily. Uh, I, I would be very cautious about a hairdryer because hairdryers can put a lot of heat in a, in a small space and might introduce a fracture. Um, I, I think the, historically the best answer has always been put it in the freezer. Uh, my answer has always been running in lukewarm water and, and picking it off. The melting temperature of wax is fairly low. If others have better suggestions, again, put those in the comments. But those are the ones that I know of and personally have used. So. Are we there? Uh, thank, thank you so much for participating in our virtual festival of glass. There's still some other things to be broadcast and shared uh, in the next day of the festivals. And we have a number of fun things we've been making specifically to celebrate the occasion. You can't come to us, and we do need your support at this point. Uh, the world is still standing on its ears. Blinko is in a good place, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't need you. Never think we take you for granted as part of our collector or the people who just buy for utilitarian purposes. We need you, and we thank you. Good day.